Let's welcome, put our hands together to welcome Abandi Sujato, who will be sharing real cool Nibbana, what it is and what it isn't. Over to you, Abandi. Okay, thank you so very much, Bobby. And uh, wonderful to see uh, all of you uh, here at the uh, Buddhist Gem Fellowship uh, once again after too long. Uh, may I just ask, just as a polite request from the beginning, if it's possible, um that you could share your um uh share your uh, uh your video then that would be nice because it's nice to see that there are other human beings on the other end of this and not just a bunch of black squares perhaps you've all just got enlightened and you've just vanished and disappeared and that's why there's no feed so that's great but for those of you who are still present on this human plane, it's nice to see that there are other human beings around the place. So, oh, good. Thank you so much. And good to see you here. So good to see some of our friends from uh, Sydney, from New Zealand uh, and elsewhere, as well as in um, Malaysia. And but the, most, most of the audience is uh, on Facebook Live. Most of the audience is on Facebook Live. Yes, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and also thanks to those who left a message giving happy birthday to my dad. So I mentioned to Bobby just now, I was just saying happy birthday. My dad's getting a little bit old now. He's up in Coffs Harbour on the north coast of um, New South Wales. Uh, and uh, of course, I'd love to be there for his birthday, but COVID uh, and lockdown and so on. Anyway, so thank you so much to Buddhist Gem Fellowship for inviting me to give this talk. It's a great honor and a great pleasure. And uh, I'm going to say a few words on the topic of Nibbana. Hopefully it will only be a few words because what really is there to say? One of the best teachings that I got on Nibbana was uh, in uh, KL. Oh, and Bobby, by the way, one of the things I think you, you got my, my bio from Wikipedia. One of the things I think you missed out was I also spent nearly two years in Malaysia as well, mostly in Ipoh and Penang. So I still have very fond memories of my time uh, there with the community, in, uh, especially in Ipoh. I spent most of my time there. But anyway... Uh, but um, one of the best teachings on Nibbana I got was, in fact, uh, in KL from um, uh, Venerable K. Sri Dhammananda, uh, and he said very simply that Nibbana was the ending of greed, hate, and delusion. And, okay, to a Buddhist, someone who's familiar with the Buddhist teachings, that's a, a description of Nibbana which is almost so obvious as to be boring but it really isn't that boring it's actually extremely useful because it points to nibbana as being something which relates to our own experience uh, and so the topic of nibbana the topic of the goal of the buddha's path is something which can easily attract a lot of speculation it can attract a lot of theories you know there's endless books written about the nature of nibbana and so on <clears throat> it's very easy to uh, to become very metaphysical about it. But at its heart, it's really a very simple idea. The idea that we have greed, we have hate, and we have delusion. And these things are observable realities. They're part of who we are we can look into our mind and we can see these things. And we can see that not only do we have greed, but we act out of greed. And because we act out of greed, we cause suffering for ourselves and suffering for others. We can see that not only do we have hate, but then we let hate drive our, our actions. And because of that, we cause suffering for ourselves and cause suffering for others. And we have delusion and we let delusion drive our actions and drive our choices. And because of that, we create suffering for ourselves and suffering for others. This is the problem. So when the Buddha was talking about the ending of the path, the goal of the Buddha's path, he said that it is possible to make an ending of greed, to make an ending of hate, make an ending of delusion it's possible and when we understand 
uh, Nibbana in empirical terms like this, then it's easy to see how it relates to where we are right now. So when I use the word empirical to talk about this and to talk about uh, Buddhism, what I mean is that it's something which is we can observe and which stays close to our experience, as opposed to something which is metaphysical, which is something which is speculative and divorced from our experience. So Nibbana is an empirical reality. Now, when I called the uh, title of the talk Real Cool, then I was very happy with myself because it's a very snappy title. So that made me happy. But also it has a very specific meaning. And it's not just trying to get a snappy title because Nibbana is something that the Buddha always said was a reality. Yatabhuta, it is how things are. So Nibbana is real, Yatabhuta. And when, uh, uh, and, and uh, it is also something which is uh, depicted not just in, in, in terms of being something which is real, but in terms of something which is a psychological, uh, it has a psychological appeal to it. It's something which is delightful, which, is, which draws you on. And so this is the notion of being cool. Of course, in, the Buddha was using cool. He didn't mean cool in the way that we use it today, but he meant simply cool as in like a fire whose ashes have gone cold. And in the, the climate of northern India, of course, uh, being cool was very sought after most of the time. So to say Nibbana is real cool means to say that Nibbana is something which is genuine. It actually exists. And also it means that it's something which is appealing, which is drawing us on. Now, if we dig a little bit deeper into these two aspects or these two ways of looking at Nibbana, there's something very curious about the way that the Buddha talked about it. Because the Buddha always talked about Nibbana as something which was real, no doubt about that. But in exactly what sense is it real? In, in, I mean, in a, in a way, Nibbana is the most real thing that there is because Nibbana is the end of delusion. And it's delusion that obscures the nature of reality. So in a sense, you could say that all of reality is tainted by unreality, tainted by delusion. In other words, we never really see things as they are, except for Nibbana. Nibbana is the only thing that's truly free of delusion. So in that sense, it's the most real thing in the world. But then when the Buddha was talking about it, curiously enough, he always talked about it in negatives. One of the most famous uh, sayings on Nibbana is the line, Atibikwe ajatanga bhutanga katanga sankatanga. There is. The Buddha kind of roars out of the gate. There is the unborn, the unconstructed, the unreal, the unmade. And so it's very easy for people to, people kind of latch onto this and they think of Nibbana as being some kind of space or some kind of dimension about something that, that kind of really truly woolly exists, like this, this cup exists or like this phone exists. And then there's this thing, Nibbana. The Buddha said, Ati, it, it is, there is, it's real. But what exists is Abhutam, Ajatam, Asankatam, Akatam, a series of A, a series of negatives. What he's emphatically affirming is a negation, not a presence. And so this aspect of Nibbana is very, very challenging. And so this is one of the dimensions of Nibbana, that it, it is emphatically is real, but its reality is a negation. It's a negation of this world, negation of the other world, negation of who you are, your mind, your thoughts, your feelings, your consciousness, all of the people that you know and love. None of them exist in Nibbana. All of the things that you're attached to, none of those exist in Nibbana. 
what is it? It's not anything that you can look at, anything that you can see. No, that's not what it is. Anything that you can hold on to, anything you can define or describe, that's not what it is. But it is. But it's not any of those things. And so to sort of get a handle on what Nibbana is, is quite difficult. And this is why philosophers uh, love to write long and complicated books about it. Which, look, is great. If somebody wants to write a book about it, then good on them. But I'm not sure that you're really going to get to the essence of the problem by writing another book about it. I'm going to leave that question aside just for one moment and consider the second kind, second aspect I was talking about, about it being cool. So Nibbana is real and it's cool. So what does it mean to be cool? It means that it's attractive. It means that it's delightful. Shivang. It's uh, beatific. Nibbana paramang sukhang. It is the highest happiness. Ultimate bliss. And somebody asked Venerable Sariputra about this once, how can Nibbana be ultimate bliss if there's nothing at all that's felt there? Because Nibbana is the cessation of all things, including the cessation of all feelings. And Sariputta said, it's precisely because there's nothing felt that it is the ultimate bliss. Now, when we hear these kinds of statements, then it's very easy to think of them as a, as a paradox or to think of it as a, as a, as a sort of affirming some kind of mystical entity. But just remember, the, the, that's not really who the Buddha was. The Buddha wasn't a sort of a mystic in that way. And the Buddha and his followers, they weren't trying to confuse us. If when they describe things in, in, in obscure or paradoxical ways or ways that appear paradoxical, it's because what they're pointing to is quite subtle. And so it's an invitation for us to look a bit deeper and to consider a bit more closely about what it is that they're talking about. So what did Sariputta actually mean when he said that Nibbana was blissful because there was nothing felt there? Luckily, he explained it himself and he went on to talk about that and he said, well, uh, consider, and this is a paraphrase, of course, not an actual translation. Uh, if somebody wants to... Uh, find the uh, sutta number, they, it's on sort of central, they can throw it in the chat. I can't remember the sutta number off the top of my head. Anyway, uh, and uh, we, we all have feelings right now. Okay, so you're sitting there listening to this Dhamma talk and you have different feelings. You maybe feel happy to hear, hear the Dhamma. You maybe feel bored. You maybe feel distracted. You maybe feel annoyed. If somebody's forced you to come and listen to this boring Dhamma talk, you might be annoyed with them. You might be uh, excited and thrilled. You might be confused and all of these kinds of things. You know, you might have, there might be other things not to do with the Dhamma talk. You might be worried. You might be anxious. You know, all of these feelings that we're having. And these feelings that we have, they kind of define our life. And much of our life is spent in search of having more pleasant feelings and running away from unpleasant feelings. And that search, that push and that pull towards pleasure away from pain, towards pleasure away from pain. This is why our lives are so full of anxiety and so, and it's so hard for us to, to, to rest and to be at peace and to be content. So the very fact of these feelings is what drives the experience of suffering. And we can understand this on just a very simple level. Imagine that um, you get a nice ice cream. Yay, everyone likes ice cream. Well, most people like ice cream. Let's assume we like ice cream. And uh, if there are any vegans out there, it's vegan ice cream. Okay, no problems. And hopefully there's no allergy issues or whatever. But anyway, let's assume that we've got some ice cream. Yum. Now we have the first thing of ice cream. It's nice. And what, the, what we have then is like a pleasant feeling, a pleasant sensation. Mm. The sweetness of it, the cold coolness of it, the feel of it on the tongue. And also like memories, like they kind of evoke 
uh, a nice flavor or something like that evokes memories, you know, especially as you get older, you, you find that the, the, the flavors and the things that you like are not necessarily just defined by what the thing is, but they're defined by your associations with it, like what you had when you were in your childhood or what are the cultural associations with things that makes you happy to have something that, um, that maybe reminds you of when you were a kid. So anyway, you have all of these uh, feelings as a result of eating the ice cream. That's nice. So you have another one. And then you get what the economists call opportunity cost. So it means that basically each time you have a, a new one, new, a new bite of ice cream, it's not quite as much, not quite as pleasurable as the last one. But if you consider the first one, the pleasure you get from the first bite of ice cream. Mm, nice. It's good. Yeah. But one of the things about it is that it is very fleeting. I once, when I was a very young monk in Thailand, uh, we were, you know, when, when, when we were, you know, monks in the uh, Wat Nana Chart and that in Chart tradition there, then, you know, those days it was pretty Spartan. Like, I'm not going to pretend it wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, the horror stories that you might hear from some of the more senior monks who tell about like eating insects and frogs and things like that. No, 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 it wasn't, it wasn't like that. We had, we ate brown rice and tofu and we had good food in the monastery most of the time. Um, but, you know, it was mostly, it was, you know, it was, uh, 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 you know, it was a, not a hugely luxurious lifestyle. Anyway, one time one of the monks had his mother was visiting and we were traveling a little bit. We ended up in Chiang Mai and we ended up going to a cafe and having an ice cream sundae. So that was nice. And we had this ice cream sundae and then, and then he just looked at me and he said, I knew it was impermanent, but I I'd forgot that it was that impermanent. <laughs> and they really are. Food is incredibly impermanent. It hits your tongue and immediately it starts going downhill. Yeah, enjoy it for a few seconds and then you swallow it. Next one's not quite as good. The one after is not quite as good. And then in a very short time, basically you're not really interested in it anymore. You don't want to have any more. And if you do, then you probably get sick. So this is the nature of those pleasures in the world. And not only are they fleeting and not very satisfying, but also they are. Um, there's a certain... Uh, anxiety about them because there's this this tension about getting the one that you want you know and I'm sure you've all probably seen this if you go to like a restaurant or something like that and uh, people order food and you know they get the food that's not not exactly the way they like it you know it's too salty or it's you know they've got the wrong one or it's got the wrong side dish or something like that and then people get really upset about that they get really angry yelling at people because they didn't get the right food. It's crazy. You're just going out for a nice night. You know, there's nothing wrong with that, just asking politely. But that's because of that tension. People have that fear underlying that. Why do people get like that? Why do people get so upset when they don't get exactly the thing that they want? It's because underlying it is this fear. This fear knowing that those things that you love are going to be taken away from you and you can't cope with it. And so you attach to it and you hold on to it so tightly. And, but it's taken away from you no matter how, because we can't control them. So any kind of pleasure that we have in the world has this kind of underlying sense of tension to it. This is what the Buddha called sankara dukkha. It's a suffering because things are conditioned. And that's not even a feeling so much. That's just a, it's just a, a, a part of the fabric of reality. It's like a tension in the fabric of reality. So let's say that you understand this. Let's say that you understand, okay, the sensual pleasures are there, they're, they're fine, it's okay. It's okay to enjoy a nice meal, to have some pleasant company and all of those things, that's fine. But is there more to life also? And we come to Buddhism, we meditate and we find some peace in our meditation. Ah, that's different. That's strange, isn't it? And I don't know if you can recall it, but I certainly can, like the first moment when you found peace in meditation. Maybe it hasn't happened for you yet. You know, everyone's on different stages in their spiritual journey. Maybe you've started to meditate and you're like, when is the peace going to come? <laughs> if that's who you are, then you have my 
my, my sympathy and my encouragement to keep going, you will find it. And you might be thrilled to know that that feeling that you have when you meditate and everything's going bad and it feels terrible, then the Buddha actually had a word for this. He called it uh, niramisa domanasa. It means a spiritual depression. It means when you're meditating and you're longing, oh, when am I going to experience that bliss of all of those profound things that the Buddha talked about? Niramisa domanasa. So if that's where you are, at least you know there's a word in partly for what you have. So that's excellent. You know, we're not, we're not always, I think, completely honest in the way that we market meditation. We always say meditation, it makes you peaceful and it makes you happy and those kinds of things. And of course, that's true, but the road there can be a bit rocky, can't it? And you can go through a lot of different kinds of feelings on your way to becoming peaceful. And it can be a long road and it can take you down many byways and you can get very confused and very lost along the way. And that's why we have friends. That's why we have a spiritual community. That's why we help each other. Yeah, that's when that's why these things come in really important. That's why you can't just think we're going to do it by itself. We need a community. We need people around us. We need to support each other. Actually, which just reminds me, one thing I wanted to say, Bobby, when I was just watching the, um, the slideshows you had before the talk today, uh, I saw that uh, you're promoting uh, different centres and different teachers and so on through that thing and sort of encouraging that network of different teachers around the place. And I just wanted to mention that and to congratulate you and say that that's a really wonderful to see that because sometimes you see that uh, uh, centres just want to keep everything for themselves and they'll only promote themselves and won't promote other centres. But I'm so happy to see that you are promoting uh, people, different people practising in different places because in the Buddhist community or indeed in the human community, we're not enemies and we're not competitors, we're all friends. And the more that we can help each other, the better everyone will be. So, um, so when we get lost in our meditation, that's when we need our friends to give us encouragement and support. But let's say we persevere and we do find that peace and we do let go and we do experience that joy. We're like, huh, what is that? What is that joy? Why is it it's so strange when you first experience it? It's so weird. And for me, it was, it was transformational. Because, and I realized that under, underlying that, why was it so powerful for me? Because underlying that, I always just kind of thought that it couldn't be me who would experience these things. Maybe someone else could. Right? Other people can be spiritually advanced and, and, and enlightened and great sages or even just people who have it together or whatever, but not me. You know, I wouldn't. That's, that, that can't be who I am. And then when, and you don't even realize this, right? you don't even realize it until it happens. And then you're so surprised. Huh, How, where did that come from? How did that feeling of bliss descend upon me of all people? It seems so random, it seems so astonishing. And as we learn to meditate more and more, you begin to find that actually that, that's not just, that's not just a, a coincidence. It's not just something random. It's something that you can develop, something that to a certain degree you can control or at least um, you can like acculturate yourself and condition yourself to be able to move towards that sense of peace. And over time, you begin to realize that that's always been in you, that that peace of mind and that joy has always been a part of you and it's always been accessible in you, but you just haven't really paid it any attention. And the reason that it's always been there is because it's just the cessation of all of those things that are bringing you suffering. So the joy that comes with meditation is not really the joy of anything it's the joy of letting go when you let go of thoughts it's peaceful that's oh, nice you let go of worries ah oh, it's peaceful it's nice and you realize you don't actually need these things to make your mind peaceful 
and 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 and, and as you go further down, your understanding deepens. You begin to realize, almost kind of shockingly, you begin to realize that the reason your mind is peaceful is because it's the nature of your mind to be peaceful. It's not that you have to do something special to make it peaceful. Of course, it's also the nature of the mind to be suffering. Stress is part of the nature of the mind. Anxiety is part of the nature of the mind. Grief is part of the nature of the mind. These are all part of the nature of the mind as well, just as we can see that in the world. Fire is part of the nature of the world. Climate change is the nature of the world. Turmoil, pandemic, all of these things, these are sufferings and they're real sufferings and they're part of how the world is. And we have to accept that reality. And those realities are reflected inside us as well. That's real. But just as climate change is a reality, but also beautiful sunsets are also part of reality. And the pandemic is a reality, that's true. But also the love of parents for their children is also a reality. And reality is not just one thing and it's not just the other. It has beautiful things in it and it has painful and suffering things as well. So what we're learning in our meditation is that we are learning to be able to let go of those things that create suffering and to develop those things that create peace and happiness. And when we let go of that suffering, we experience that peace. Then we have a sense of wonder and a sense of curiosity and eagerness to go further. It's so called chanda. It's this eagerness to take the next step. Ha, huh, if I let go just a little bit, I experience this much happiness, this much peace. What happens if I let go even more? And so you keep going, meditate more and more and more. And that long process begins of learning to let go at deeper and deeper levels. And at each deeper level you, you let go, then your mind experiences a deeper level of peace and happiness. At a deep level in meditation, you can let go and experience the bliss of jhanas. And the bliss of jhanas is nothing more than the letting go of your attachment to the sense world. That's it. These, these things are the flip sides of each other. It's not like there's a thing of jhanas, so you go from this thing to that thing. It's that our attachment to this thing is causing us suffering. And we let go of that thing, that suffering doesn't exist anymore. And in a deep state of meditation like jhana, the suffering that's left is very, very small. And just like a tiny bit of residue. And the further and further and deeper you go into meditation, the more that suffering diminishes until there's just a, like this tiny bit left over. But even those deep states of meditation still have some suffering because they're still impermanent. They're still conditioned, they come to an end. And so this is where the Buddha then took the next step and said, well, if I can let go of all of these things, what happens if I let go even of these purified mind in meditation? This, 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 this radiant consciousness that I experience in deep meditation, what if I was to let go of that? What would that be like? And so this is that kind of uh, what the Buddha called akaravati sadha, which means reasoned faith. And reasoned faith means we take it step by step. And we see the results of it each step. And so we don't make a blind leap of faith and say, well, I'm going to let go of everything right at the beginning. Say, well, what if I let go of this thing? Ah, and then what if I let go of that thing? Ah, and what if I let go of the next thing? Ah, and you experience the results of it at each point. So this is how we can understand that Nibbana is a, an outcome of letting go, an outcome of cessation, and how it draws us along step by step. And when we experience it in our meditation, it's experienced as something which is beautiful and something which is freeing. And yet, what is that freedom? If you look at how the Buddha, the similes that the Buddha used to talk about freedom, you know, he talked about, say, a, a man getting released from a prison. 
And we can understand that. I don't know if any of you have been in prison. I've never been in prison. I had my, my best friend when I was younger was, had been in prison a number of times. And he always recommended that I should spend a few days in prison just so that I knew what it was like. He said, you, you'll never understand what freedom is until you've been to jail. And he says it just completely changes your perspective on freedom when they just, you realize that they can just take it away from you whenever they want. So, so far, I haven't managed to live up to his <laughs> recommendation. I don't know, maybe they'll arrest me for going on a climate change demonstration or something one day. So um, anyway, uh, I'll, I, I, I don't know. So far, I've been okay. Um, freedom is what, like when you get out of jail, but what is that like to get out of jail? Like, what is that state of somebody who gets out of jail? One person gets out of jail and they immediately go, yeehaw, and go and get drunk. Somebody else gets out of jail and goes and sees their family. Somebody else gets out of jail and they just wander down the street feeling lost and lonely because they don't know what to do with themselves. Every person who gets out of jail is different. There's no one thing that makes that defines that experience we can't sort of pin it down and say this is what getting out of jailness is another simile the buddha used was like um, nibbana is arogyang yeah, means a state of healthiness free of disease and again same thing what is what is a state of health i mean we can define what a state of sickness is fairly easily but how do we define a state of health well the absence of sickness and Healthy people are all healthy in their own ways. So it's not really it's not really possible to really sort of pin down one specific essence of these things and say that's what it means. And so this is why the Buddha, when he talked about Nibbana, he talked about these different aspects. He talked about it as something which is real and something which is cool, Siti Buddha. But the realness of it is a absence or a cessation or a negation. It's really what is not born, what is not created, what is not made. And uh, if I was to express that technically, you could say that uh, in ontological terms, Nibbana is negative, but in psychological terms, Nibbana is positive. So whenever the Buddha talked about it, he painted it as the refuge, the harbour, the safe shore, the, the beatific, the blissful. But when he talked about it in terms of what is real, he always talked about it in negative terms. Now, of course, we're still attached. And as long as we haven't realised Nibbāna, then we have to assume that we're still attached. And to hear about Nibbāna talk is, is kind of scary. And people get freaked out by it. They think that they're going to stop existing. They think they're going to become annihilated. And if you're scared by Nibbana, good. You're starting to get it. Even in the Buddha's day, the devas were said to be uh, terrified when they would hear the teaching of Nibbana. We thought we were permanent, but it turns out we're impermanent. We thought that we were going to be surrounded by this bliss and happiness forever, but it turns out that all this will be taken away from us. And so there's something about the idea of Nibbana which is challenging. And good, it should be challenging. If it's the purpose of a religious life or a spiritual life is not just to reassure you and to pat you on the head and say, there, there, everything will be okay. There's more to it than that. Yes, sometimes that's what we need, right? Sometimes we need comfort and reassurance. But the highest goal of the spiritual life, it needs to be something challenging, something dangerous, something threatening, something that can pull the rug out from under everything that we know and think and believe. And there will come a time in your life, if you pursue this path of Dhamma, there will come a time in your life when you confront this. 
And it may happen when you are on uh, a deep meditation in retreat. And sometimes you can be on retreat and then everything just goes away. And you're just there and there's just nothing all around you. You can't say that there's blackness all around you because blackness is a something. There's just nothing. Maybe, maybe you'll experience something completely different. Maybe it won't be on retreat. Maybe it'll be when you're getting yourself a glass of water from the water cooler. And then suddenly it will just strike you out of the blue. All of this is conditioned. And Nibbana is unconditioned. And you'll see it for the first time. And when you see it and you understand the reality of it, it's kind of scary. It's kind of getting a glimpse behind the curtain. It's seeing, seeing the reality of the world, seeing the emptiness of everything. So this is challenging. Now, this is, this is not something that we should force on ourselves. If, you, if, you, if, you, if you're hearing what I'm saying and you can't relate to it at all, and you're like, what, what is that Australian monk going on about? That's so weird, okay? Then just ignore everything that I've said for the last few minutes. It's fine. <laughs> it's okay. No one can force these things. But the time will come when you will reach that point in your journey when you see, you get a glimpse, and you go, wow. And it's, I think it's really important for us to know that we are not alone in this experience and we're not crazy and we're not, we're not, we're not, it's not delusional. This is, this is a real experience. So Nibbana, the experience of Nibbana is reality in terms of an insight into it, but it's an insight into emptiness, into the ending of all things. And as soon as we start to try to pin that down, as soon as we try to define it, we say that, well, it's a dimension. We say it's a, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of consciousness. This is what people call it sometimes. Some people use words for it. And they try to say, oh, Nibbana is a kind of radiant consciousness. Or they say it's an original mind. Or they say it's this. Or they say it's that. And as soon as you try to pin it down, you trap yourself. And you, you trap yourself in words. And you trap yourself in your attachments. And this is why the Buddha was very skillful about these things. There's a really nice discussion with Ajahn Chah about this, um, where uh, one of the monks who was with him in Thailand, who was a, a French monk, asked him about this idea of the original mind, which some of the Thai uh, forest Ajahns talk about. And he said, What's, what is this original mind? And Ajahn Chah just sort of grunted and said, what are you talking about? He said, well, the original mind, you know, he said, well, you know, what is it? Because Ajahn Chah would never really talk about that. And Ajahn Chah said, well, look, you know, he said, he said, look, if you want to talk about original mind, he said, see, he said, see, have a look at this cup. You see, the cup's there. It's in that spot. Yeah. Now, if I take that cup away, like, see, see, there's the original spot. That's what the original mind is. But the cup's gone, it's finished, it's vanished, it's ceased. He used this whole kind of series of words, mot, uh, sin, and this whole kind of series of words to emphasize it's gone, it doesn't exist anymore. But you can call it the original place because, well, that's originally where it was. So he said that's what it means. So in our practice, practice to, to realize the goal of the path, one of the things that Nibbana does as just an idea, so purely on the conceptual level, is Nibbana is there as a constant reminder that there is more to do. It's a constant uh, 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 recognition of the fact that we haven't let go completely yet. We can do more. But more than that, it's more than just we haven't let go completely yet, but it's also we can. We can let go more. Why? Because it's just the same thing as we've already let go of. And if you have ever let go of anything at all, 
then you can realize Nibbana. It's as simple as that. All of us can let go. That's all Nibbana is, is letting go. And we let go a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And the Buddha has said, I would not ask you to do anything impossible. I know it's possible. That's why I ask you. So never tell yourself, oh, that's not for me. Never tell yourself, oh, I could never get enlightened. Never tell yourself, this is, you know, this is for the monks and the nuns. This is for those people who are much more advanced than me. It's not. Vediyamanasa, the Buddha said. Vediyamanasa, for one who feels. That's who he taught for, for one who feels. So do you have feelings? Do you feel happy and sad? Do you feel suffering and pain? I'm betting that you do. <laughs> I was in Singapore once and, uh, and teaching and they, they said that there'd been a survey uh, of Singaporeans that said like a, a disturbing number of, of Singaporeans had said that they experienced no emotions at all like 40% or something crazy of Singapore people said that they never have any emotions. Crazy, right? And I know that obviously that's not going to be true of Malaysians because Malaysians have lots of emotions and that's not going to be true. But, but it shows you that it's different. It shows you that like how people can think that way to be so detached from the reality of their own experience. Of course that people have emotions, right? Of course they are. But sometimes we can be put into a society or a culture where we are like expected to not feel them or to not acknowledge them or to not know them. Yeah. So we feel. And if we feel, we can understand suffering. And we can understand that this suffering was caused by greed, hate, and delusion. This is really where it comes back down to. And so this is where we keep on looking in our meditation. So, you know, one of the things that I, I always find a little bit sort of bamboozling in meditation, I'll be honest, in the Buddhist community is everybody's so uh, interested in, you know, what does this teacher say or what does that teacher's school say or what does that meditation do or how do you do this retreat or all of these kinds of things. And what the, what the Buddha wasn't really worrying about those kinds of things. I mean, if you find those different kind of schools and teachings or whatever useful, then okay, fine. But what the Buddha was talking about was, the end of greed, the end of hate, and the end of delusion. Can you see those things inside yourself? Can you see greed? Then let go of it. Can you see hate? Let go of it. Can you see delusion? Let go of it. And develop the opposite of those things. Instead of greed, develop uh, generosity. Instead of hate, develop love. Instead of delusion, uh, develop intelligence and wisdom understanding those things are the things that lead us to nibbana there's nothing mystical about it nothing mysterious about it it's not something that's just for the buddhas not something that's just for the sangha it's not just something for uh, people who have kind of special good karma or something like that it's for everyone who feels okay that's probably and good enough for now. What do you think, Bobby? We should, what, do you think we maybe should take some questions? Yes, Acha. Okay. Good. So um, I, I, we've got we've got questions in the chat here. Do you have question, other questions from Facebook or whatever as well? Uh, the questions from Facebook are pasted on the chat here. They are on the chat already, are they? Yeah. But okay. so far, there's only one. Uh, so far, only one. So we've got a few messages, but not many questions. Yep, mostly messages. All right, so that's up for uh, for you lot to um, give some more questions. But meanwhile, um, meanwhile, one, Cheryl yes. Lim has given yes. a good one. So let's just see about that. Okay, does it mean that I cease to exist? Cheryl says this. So. Um, uh, Cheryl, would that be a problem for you? I mean, if you did cease to exist, what would happen? 
you'd like to just blink out one day and just weren't there anymore. I mean, it's kind of appealing in some ways, right? I mean, you wouldn't have to fill out your tax returns for a start. Um, you wouldn't have to worry about um, whether people liked your latest post on Facebook um, or whatever other worries you have in your life, they would all be gone. But then all of the good things in your life would be gone as well, right? So it's kind of a bit of a mixed bag. So to say that I cease to exist is a somewhat fraught question. And I think that the Buddha would answer that question by saying that uh, it's, it's, it's not how we should be looking at it, or it's not the right way of looking at the question. Why? Because it assumes that there is an I there in the first place. So if we assume that I am there, that there is an I, then that, yeah, it sounds like you're going to cease to exist. But of course, the Buddha taught about not self. So um, there's no I there in the ultimate sense or in the highest sense. Now, this is something to be careful about how we use language in Buddhism, of course, because most of the time we do have an I and we do have a self and it's just, you know, we're not like crazy, right? We don't go into a uh, government office to fill in a form and they say, who are you? And you say, well, I'm not anybody because I don't exist in the ultimate sense, right? We just fill in our name and that's who I am. And we don't have a problem out of that. But here we're talking at a very high level, at a very subtle level. Uh, and just as in a um, uh, physical sense, you know, consider in physics, you know, you might have like, um, uh, uh, you know, materials, you know, you have like bricks and wood and these kinds of things. But if a physicist were to look at that, he'd say, well, actually, there are uh, electrons and neutrons and so on. But these days they have like quarks and positrons and all of these kinds of things that I don't even understand. So if we're looking at it in that ultimate sense or in that very deep sense, then you say, well, it's really that that concept of I is a, a construct or a concept which is useful for certain kinds of things. But at this point, it's not useful anymore. So there's no I there in the first place. What there is, is a process. And that process is suffering. And that suffering ceases. Yeah. In... Uh, so one of the things that the Buddha said, of course, for, for somebody, if somebody becomes enlightened, they realize the Dhamma in this very life, then life goes on, you know, pretty much the same as it did before, except without all the bad bits. So, you know, the life of somebody who's become enlightened, you know, they have thoughts, they have feelings, they have to uh, eat food and all of those things, and they behave like a kind of a normal person, except without all the neurotic bits and without all the suffering bits. But when they die, they don't get reborn because they're not attached to anything. No. Okay, uh, so I'm not sure if that's going to answer your question, but but Cheryl, like a, 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 another way of looking at that same question is to sort of come around it from the other side. I mean, that's why I tried to um, talk about it in the way that I did today because it's something that it's something that emerges as a deepening of faith and understanding through the practice of your path. If you look at it from the beginning of the path and you say, well, what is that thing at the end? That sounds so wild and so crazy that it's very, very threatening and very damaging. But when we go follow the path step by step, you begin to realize that actually it's something beautiful. All right, so I don't know if that's helpful, Cheryl, but if it, if it is not, then please ask another question and I'll see if I can answer that one. Anyway, see, we've got another one. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this correctly. Niwan, 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 is that correct? Okay. Yeah. Um, one of the challenges of meditation practice is when we start to get into some calmness, we have a tendency to doubt it, e.g. this can't be it, right? So we're second guessing our practice all the time and or, or the other one, which is we're like, oh, this is it. And you get excited. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Finally, I'm peaceful. Yay. Oh, hang on. No, I'm not peaceful anymore. Oh, I better start again. So, yeah. So what happens is that mind is mind is uh, like a spiral or like a hall of mirrors. It's very reflective. And it's always kind of bits of the mind are looking at other bits of the mind. And in that process, when we're going along in our meditation, actually the process of meditation and the process, process 
towards which meditation is going is a process towards letting go and a process of wholeness. And what that means is that uh, we have all of these different bits in our minds. Uh, our minds tend to be quite segregated and different parts of our mind will work in different kinds of ways. And they tend to be somewhat divided off from each other. And this is, this is, a, this is normal. Right? For this to happen is normal. It's not unhealthy. It's unhealthy if it becomes extreme. But normally, this is what we do because you know if you're I don't know if you're if you're um, uh, uh, suffering from grief, for example, you have to show up to work and still do your job. And so we learn to cope by putting aside our grief and dealing with that when we when we can. And so we have these coping mechanisms that can allow us to sort of divide different parts of our mind from each other. And you know that's in a in a normal healthy mind, then that's what allows us to cope. But what we're doing meditation is that we gradually re release all of those barriers in the mind right? and all of the boundaries between the different parts of the mind are gradually a little bit by little bit taken down. And actually, this is similar in some respects to drug experiences. And people who've had drug experiences you know, often compare them to meditation experiences and vice versa. And, and this is the reason why. But the thing is, in, in, in a drug experience, this happens in a chaotic way. Right? The parts of the, the mind and the brain are like shaken up and the walls between the mind, the brain are taken down, but there's nothing which is guiding that. There's no, it's purely a chemical response. And when that's over, you go back to how you were before, except hopefully without damaging your brain. But in meditation, you do that in a guided way and in a way that is informed by values and principles, especially in a way that's formed by your sila. Right? So this is a way that's through a healthy and um, uh, a positive way that's going to develop and grow your mind uh, in a good direction. So we get to a point, we get to a calmness. And part of our mind has become calm. One part of our mind has become calm. Another part of our mind is not there yet. Right? Well, this part of our mind is, is still attached. And then this part of our mind is like, no, 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 that can't be real. What's that? I've never seen that before. <laughs> it can't be, that can't be me. Can't be and so these negative criticism comes back in. Mm -hmm. Or the other one is to say, oh, yeah, that, that is me. That's who I am. That's just a kind of an egoistic response. Yeah, oh, yes, I'm, I'm the one who has this peace of mind. I'm the one who's now, oh, this must be a jhana. Oh, now I've got a jhana. That's great. Oh. Oh, it's really good. Oh, it must be a really deep one now. I must have fourth channel. Oh, I must be enlightened now. I'm just going to go and update my Facebook status, tell everybody that I'm an arahant. So that's fantastic. So, uh, so this is what happens, right? So this, is, this, this doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with the experience. It just means that the experience is incomplete, right? It means you're, you're still on the path. So when those things happen, you keep this, and that's where mindfulness comes in. Mindfulness comes in, ah, that mind which is doubting. This is wichikicha. This is one of the five hindrances. When, what that doubt is telling me, so what the doubt says, okay, what the doubt says is, this can't be it. This is not me. This can't be real. That's what the doubt says, right? But what the doubt means is, ah, yes, you still have that hindrance. Right? So wisdom understands this is just that hindrance of doubt. Right? One of the odd things about meditation is that when you start to go deeper into the meditation, sometimes these things happen in a way that they didn't happen before. And you can find that these things will surface. Like people, for example, will do some metta meditation. They feel very happy, feel very peaceful. And then suddenly they get this anger will come up. And they'll be full of hate and annoyance. Oh, my God, that person, they can't stop thinking about that person who was so annoying. And it might have been just something really small that they did, but they're going, going around and you think, what's going on? I'm supposed to be doing metta meditation. And I've got all this hate. I'm such a failure. I'm the one, I'm the bad one. I do, I'm such a failure doing meta meditation. No, 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 it's just, that's just how it works. You can think of it like a, a clean house. Like if you've got a house that's kind of really filthy, you've never cleaned it and there's got mud all over the floor. I'm sure that would be none of you who've done that because I'm sure you all have clean houses, but just hypothetically imagining it. Then uh, if somebody walks into your house with muddy shoes on, 
doesn't really, you can't even really notice. Or maybe your dog goes running around outside and comes in with muddy footprints and nobody even really sees because everything's so filthy. But then you decide, oh, I'm sick of it. I'm not going to live in this filthy house anymore. I'm going to clean it. So you just clean everything, wash everything, scrub everything, and everything is pristine. And then the dog comes in with his muddy fork, paw prints, and you're like, what are you doing, dog? Get out. And you see it. So when your mind is starting to become um, subtle, then these hindrances start to become apparent. You start to notice, ah, okay, that's what these things are. And when you see it, that's good because that's wisdom, right? Seeing the doubts, seeing the fact that you're doubting is wisdom. That's one side of part of your mind, observing another part of your mind, you're understanding, ah, that doubting is undercutting my meditation. And you see, even in your question, that wisdom is already there in your question because your question is already, well, I can have this calm and yet then I have these doubts. And so you understand what's going on until you've meditated and realized that calm. You don't even understand that much. You don't even really see how that doubt is undermining your peace of mind. So the fact that you're seeing that is a sign of your wisdom. And the five hindrances, of course, are the dubli, uh, panya dubli karana, are the, the uh, weakeners of wisdom. So when you're seeing that, your wisdom is growing, and this is a sign that the hindrances are actually starting to diminish, starting to fade away. So if you see doubt in your meditation, don't worry about it. It's good. Ah, I see. Why? The doubt isn't good, but the fact that you see it is good. Ah, I see you. Ah, and if you can see it, usually it's not such a big problem. Okay, so uh, from Bindu. Bindu says, thank you. Well, thank you, um, uh, Bindu. That is very kind of you. I'm very happy to be able to share some Dhamma with you today. Uh, Jillian, how's it going, Jillian? Going okay there? <laughs> How, how's, how's lockdown? How are you coping with lockdown? All right. All right, you're, you're getting, getting by okay. All right. Um, okay. So Jillian asks, is it possible to experience it, presumably it being Nibbana, I'm guessing, and uh, know, and not know what it is that has been experienced? Mm, right? Interesting one. Probably not, I don't think. Um, but, but, but in, in a, um, but, uh, but in a, uh, it, it's, sorry. It's not possible to experience it and to not know what you've experienced. However, uh, you might not know all of the different aspects and especially all of the different ways that it's talked about. So you would know what it is. You might not know that it is called this, right? Uh, so, you know, let's say, so in Buddhism, for example, you have the idea of Vacheka Buddha. So somebody who, you know, completely outside of the Buddhist community or whatever, simply through their own meditation can come and can experience Nibbana themselves. So they would know what that experience is. They wouldn't know that it's called Nibbana, right? But if Vacheka Buddha then later stumbled across a Buddhist sutta or something and then read about it, then they'd probably recognize it. And they'd say, oh, actually, that's that thing that I was that I experienced it. So they would, they would kind of learn that. So I don't think you know every aspect of that experience, but you know that there is uh, that letting go. And it's, it's, like, it's like something vanishes. Some part of you vanish, vanishes, and you, you never even knew that that part of you existed. And now it's gone. And you only know because it's absent. Yeah. All right. So we're getting a few more questions there. So I'll try to I'll try to go through the questions a little bit uh, quicker. So I know that uh, Malaysian Dhamma practitioners are very good at asking questions. So I'm very happy to see this. One of the challenges of meditation practice is we start to get into some calmness. We have a tendency to doubt it. Okay, e.g., this can't be it. Is it possible we sabotage our own experience? Oh, hang on, this is the same one we already had. Hang on. Is it so, so, Sam, but it was possible to sabotage our own experience of calmness. So, this is a slightly more developed version of the one we had before. Um, yes, but it adds that part. It, is it possible to, to sabotage our own experience of calmness? Yes, it is. But, that, but, but just remember that that sabotage is a normal part of the process. 
all right? It's not, not a sign that something's wrong. It's just a sign that things are incomplete. So when that happens, uh, you just, what do you do? You go back to the beginning and you start again. Come back to your basic meditation, start watching your breathing, and don't, 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 the mistake that comes in there. See, I'll tell you what, see, see when, when, when people reach that point, they have a doubt and they think the doubt's the problem. But no, 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 no. The doubt isn't the problem because that's just one of the five hindrances and it's just the kind of the dying spasms of the hindrances. They know they're on the deathbed, they're on their way out and they're just trying to hold you in Nibbana. Don't worry about that too much. The doubt is when you sort of think about it and you identify it with it. And if you start to think, oh, I can't do this or this is too hard, then that becomes a problem because that becomes embedded as a view right? that becomes, oh, you know, this is too much. Yeah. So that's really the problem. So just, just you know that's all right. Okay, come back, start at the beginning, be patient. Don't think, don't think, oh, I'm going to try to get back to that state. I'm going to get back to that calmness. That calmness doesn't exist. It never did exist. It was just the ending of certain hindrances and certain, and it was just the experience of letting go. So don't you, you don't get back to that state. Come back to your meditation and just start your meditation again. Let go. That's all. Okay. Marie asks, where do we go when we knock on the door of Nibbana? Well, I can't really say. I know that uh, Bob Dylan, of course, has his knocking on heaven's door. Perhaps we need our Buddhist version of knocking on Nibbana's door. Uh, and I don't know uh, what the answer would be. Where do we go? Um, we don't go anywhere because we weren't anywhere in the first place. Okay, uh, you know, but, but I mean, you know that the Buddha gave the simile of the fire going out, right? So when the fire goes out, uh, where does it go? Well, it's not really a proper question, but you, all you can say is before it was burning and now it's cool. What advice did the Buddha give for dealing with spiritual depression? Good, uh, good question. Uh, and there's a number of uh, different passages and suttas that kind of address this in, in different ways. The Buddha was always kind of very encouraging of people. Uh, and for example, um, uh, just before the Buddha passed away, uh, when uh, Venerable Ananda realized that his beloved teacher was soon to die, uh, he couldn't stand it and he went away and was crying. And he was crying not because he, not just because he was going to lose his beloved teacher, but because he was thinking that uh, he was not yet fully enlightened. He was still only a stream enterer, only a learner. He still had so much more to, to go. And his teacher was going to be gone from him and wouldn't be there to guide him anymore. And so he was in tears because of this. And when the Buddha heard this, he invited Ananda to come back and then he gave a, a teaching. He said he gave a teaching all about the wonderful and marvelous qualities of Venerable Ananda and taught everybody that, and reminded him of how much he meant to people, that when people saw him, they were so happy to see him. They were so enthusiastic about listening to him teaching the Dhamma and about how much goodness that he brought into the world and into people's lives. So this is the Buddha's response to that, yeah? to give people encouragement and support and to give them comfort. Uh, if we're, if we're feeling that sense of spiritual depression, if we're feeling that we're getting frustrated, feeling like we're getting nowhere in our practice, if feeling like, you know, I've been doing this for so many years, where am I getting? All of those things. Yeah, this is where we need people. This is where we need friends. We need Kalyana Mitta. We need a spiritual community. And I know that it's really hard like at the moment because of the pandemic and lockdown and all of those things. Keeping the community going is such an important thing, you know. And, and of course, for many of us, uh, we have an opportunity, you know, the, for us as, as Dhamma practitioners, lockdown brings a lot of opportunities. And, you know, a lot of the feedback that, that we get from our community here in Sydney is, you know, how are you coping with the lockdown? And people say, oh, it's great. I love it. And I get to do more meditation. I don't have to drive to work. And, you know, in some cases, like, uh, say, uh, young uh, young parents, uh, where the the father especially uh, gets to spend more time with the baby and with the kids growing up. Yeah, you know, some of these kinds of things I think are really major benefits. But then, of course, then there's so many costs as well. So, as spiritual practitioners, we have the opportunity to meditate and to do our practice. That's great. 
but don't imagine that you're going to do it all alone. Keep that contact with people, keep coming to events like this, to groups like that, Ma maintain contacts with your spiritual friends because this is what keeps us, gives us that inspiration, gives us that encouragement, gives us that, gives us that reminder. And also don't forget that it's not just about what that community will do for us, but also about what we do for others. And don't forget that in this time in particular, that there are so many people around us who do not have the Dhamma. And we might be thinking, oh, I'm struggling in my meditation. I haven't been able to overcome these hindrances. But there are so many other people who don't even know what a hindrance is. They've never even started to meditate. They've never even got any idea of what it might be to find peace of mind. And those people need help and they need support as well. So don't forget to look around you in your community, in your family, in your neighborhood, in your colleagues, in your friends, and to reach out to people who are struggling because a lot of the, the cost in this uh, terrible pandemic, you know, we know the cost in terms of the, the health cost and the, uh, you know, the amount of people who get sick, the amount of people who die, and we know that. But a lot of it is also undercover and for the people who are already struggling, people who are struggling with addiction, people struggling with mental illness, people struggling in, in homes with uh, uh, domestic violence, uh, people in situations where they are vulnerable. These are people who are going to be uh, in special need. So make sure to look out for those and to try to uh, give help and give, to give the love of the Dhamma to all of those who need it around you. Okay, so moving on. Ty tigris lupus that is a great name does that mean like tiger wolf i think anyway uh if i have experienced dukkha currently will meditation help me recall such experiences to take a different path in my next rebirth assuming i did not take liberation in this life right yes it will yeah so this is one of the things that meditation does is because meditation clear clarifies your mind and it enables like, like our minds have lots of kind of junk, like think of it like static in, a, in, a, in an electric, electronic signal, you know, and that static makes it hard to hear and it makes it hard to see. And when we meditate, we clarify that static and, we, and the, the, the meaning of things and our experiences leaves a much deeper impression. So, yes, I do believe that uh, in, if you practice Dhamma in this life, then even a little bit, we might not think we're making progress, but but even a little bit will uh, create those conditions in future lives to continue the practice. I mean, I can't prove that, but that's, that is what I believe. All right. Uh, Sui Lim says, Bante, uh, how do we try to reduce delusion gradually? Well, again, good question. Uh, one fact at a time. One fact at a time, one reality at a time, one experience, one touch. If you feel confused, touch something because when you touch something you're in the present moment that's real when you see something you're seeing that that's real when when you when you feel a sensation in your body pinch yourself ah that's real so these are the things that reality so keep on bringing yourself back to that bring yourself back to that simple reality of things this is the beginning of reducing delusion and keep everything as close as you can to that experience. This is something which is really important. And I've been talking a lot about uh, recently uh, is because we are, I think, uh, we're in a world where uh, we are becoming more and more detached from reality and the incidence of conspiracy theories and all of these delusions uh, through, circulating through the world are cutting us off from a groundedness in reality. And that's the point. This is, these things are being deliberately created and spread for that purpose in order to detach people from reality and to promote uh, uh, insanity and delusion because that's useful for people. So it's really important for us to stay, if we think that the world is going crazy, it kind of is. Stay sane keep grounded, keep yourself grounded and keep the people around you grounded. Yeah, it's really important. Okay. Naibun, Naibun me, Sararaks, Sararaks, Naibun me, Sararaks. Is Nibbana enlightenment or part of, men sorry, 
is Nibbana or enlightenment part of mental sickness? Do we go to Nibbana or do we bring Nibbana into our mind? Uh, no, so, so Nibbana is not part of mental sickness because mental sickness is by its definition dysfunctional. So somebody who has any kind of mental illness, uh, their mind isn't working right. Whereas in someone who's experiences Nibbana, their mind is working right. And if somebody who uh, thinks that they've attained Nibbana, well, of course, of course there, there are many people who believe falsely that they've attained Nibbana and they may be mentally ill or delusional, that's true. Uh, and you can tell the difference. People who have Nibbana are, are, are competent and intelligent and rational and, they, and you can talk to them like an ordinary human being and they're not afraid to have a laugh about something and they're not afraid to, they're not self-defensive and they're not delusional about going on about all kinds of crazy nonsense and they're not incapable of functioning in the world. And if you look at how the Buddha was, this is why studying the suttas is so useful and studying the Vinaya also, because you see the Buddha was very down to earth. He was very practical and he wasn't, uh, he wasn't like, you know, constantly just, just, just sort of uh, gaslighting people uh, when there were genuine problems, he would adjust the, address the genuine problem. Somebody would make a kuti and the kuti, the roof would leak. He would say, monks, you should fix the leak in the kuti. And he wouldn't say to them, be mindful of the dripping of the water. All right. So he wasn't doing all of this kind of nonsense. He was, he, was, he was addressing rationally the issues and the problems that people were faced with. This is the sign of someone who's really enlightened as opposed to somebody who's delusional. Do we go to Nibbana or do we bring to Nibbana into our mind? Neither. Nibbana is simply the name we use when greed, hate, and delusion comes to an end. Okay. Tao Tao says, thank you very much for your teaching. May I know what is the best medication if having five to ten minutes per session meditation oh, before sleeping? So I said medication. I assume it means meditation. Uh, if you want to know what the best medication is, ask a doctor, but presumably it's meditation. Um, so uh, the best meditation, uh, look, whatever is useful for you, but usually breath meditation or metta meditation is good uh, just before going to sleep. If you do meditation on death and imagining skeletons just before you go to sleep, uh, then uh, enjoy your fun dreams is all I can say. Um, <laughs> but any, any kind of meditation is good, you know, but usually people do some breath meditation or some meta meditation at that time. All right. So, oh, I'm really struggling with some of these names, I'm afraid. Quip A, A B. Sorry, I'm sorry if I can't pronounce your name properly. Uh, are you able to explain what's the difference between Nibbana and Pure Land and Western Paradise? Okay, well, Pure Land and Western Paradise is uh, a concept that's developed in the uh, Mahayana traditions. So I'm not really an expert on it, so to speak. Uh, but my understanding, like if my understanding from like reading the Amitabha Sutra many years ago, you know, it talks about how it's a kind of a world where uh, like if you want to listen to Dhamma talks, then the Dhamma, talk, the Dhamma will be whispered on the wind. And if you want it to be cold, then it'll be cold. And if you want it to be hot, it'll be hot. And all of the comforts of life are provided to you. And it strikes me as being that's pretty much like living in a modern condo. I don't know. You want it to be cool. You turn the aircon on. You want to listen to Dhamma. You just put YouTube on. It's not too far away from, from the Pure Land. I don't know. So maybe we're living in the Pure Land already. And uh, this, is, this is what we've got. I, I really don't know too much. But but um, my yeah but look if you want to know about you know those teachings on the pure land then you really should ask somebody who uh, you know practices that or who, who that's an important part of their life because for me it's not um, but I my again my kind of understanding is that this is a uh, the, the foundations of this idea was as a meditation for recollection of the Buddha and the Dhamma okay. So we H. Chan, can we experience Nibbana here and now in this life? We call it digitally, not after we pass away. Yes. All right. We, we chant Sanditiko uh, Akaliko. That's what these words mean. Sanditiko and Akaliko mean you can realize it in this very life. All right. So this is a fundamental quality of the Dhamma. You can realize it in this very life. That's what those words mean. They specifically mean in this life, not in another life. Um, 
Uh, so not after we pass away. So, but also, I mean, you can realize that after you pass away as well, right? So some people will uh, die and then realize Nibbana immediately uh, or in the next life. So maybe you do a lot of practice in this life, but maybe you don't realize Nibbana or maybe just you know, one of the stages of enlightenment or something in this life, and then you continue in the next. So this also can happen. Can oneself having passed away straight attain Nibbana? I don't think so. Yeah, that actually does... Uh, there's a couple of suttas that talk about that. There's this interesting concept in the suttas called the Antara Parinibhayi, which is somebody who uh, realizes Nibbana in between. And the Buddha describes it as uh, like if you hit, if you have like a heated uh, iron, like an anvil, and you hit it and a spark flies off and the spark is glowing and hot. So that's the dukkha, but it will cool down very quickly. So before it strikes ground again, then it's already become cool. And so that's the idea that you can become enlightened in between before attaining your next rebirth. So it can happen. Not sure how common it is, but it can happen. Uh, Richard asks, Richard Quark asks, once you're enlightened, you cannot backslide. That is correct. Yes. So that's part of the definition of enlightenment is that uh, these things are gone and they're gone forever. And the Buddha was very, very emphatic about this. He said, like a palm tree with the top of the palm tree cut off that cannot regrow again. Uh, so any of the stages of enlightenment, stream entry, once return, non-return, and arahant, uh, all of them are states where something has been severed uh, and they that uh, you can't slide back from. Yeah. So Adrena, Adrena, Adrena Sia is grief and attachment. How do we each, how do we teach teenagers to meditate to let go of grief? Well, um, Adrena, that's yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm. I've, I hope that it's a sad thing if we have to do that because I know that when when we're young, that our lives should be happy and we should have, um, uh, we should be enjoying life and experiencing those good things in life. And but yes, grief comes to us when we're young sometimes too. So this is really sad. Um, yes, grief does come from attachment, but, but grief is a natural part of how our mind works. Of course, we do have attachments, right? So we shouldn't, when somebody's grieving, we shouldn't be judging them. Uh, and just to tell them that this grief comes from attachment is not really going to be very useful. So the first thing to do is if somebody's, when somebody passes away or somebody's experiencing grief, first thing we need to do is to just, just accept whatever it is that people are going through, because grieving is an extremely personal and individual process. And they have this kind of meme in pop culture of like the five stages of grief, you know, acceptance and denial and so on. It's a complete load of rubbish, right? There is no process of grieving. Grieving is extremely individual and everybody will experience it in their own way. So if anybody in your life is experiencing grief, then you need to try to support them and support each other as through that process and especially if it's younger people because of course they've never been through it before and they're learning about it for the first time so uh, and teenagers are not particularly good at processing their emotions in a wholesome way and so you know will tend to funnel out in or can easily i'm not saying it will again it's very individual but it can easily funnel out in anger and you know acting out and behavioral issues and all of these kinds of things. So it's really important to have that just acceptance and love uh, for them through that entire process, no matter how it goes. If uh, teenagers are interested to meditate, great. Then your your work is uh, uh, as a parent, it has been very successful, and you're very lucky. Yeah? Uh, so if you if the kids want to meditate, great do some meditation with them and just teach them to accept their feelings and teach them to acknowledge them, to, don't, to, 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 to not deny them or push them away. Um, and, but do it with them. Do it in community. One of the lovely things about the Buddhist tradition is that when uh, we go through grief, we do that together. We come together as communities and we, we, we share uh, that experience together because it's part of our life. So make sure that they don't feel alone and that they, they feel supported. Uh, and they, they will get over it, but um, it will take time and they will, they will grow that wisdom and that resilience that will allow them to do it more easily in the future. All right, Eric asks, 
Do I have a favorite sutta on Nibbana? Yes. Uh, Dhatu Ibanga Sutta. Majjhima Nikaya number 140. I did a whole retreat on it a couple of years ago. Uh, Al Chan. Al, Al, Al Chan or Al, Al Chan. Uh, self sabotaging part of past karmic life doings. How can one overcome it? Nah, is it part of past life? Who knows? I mean, maybe, yeah, who can say? I mean, it doesn't really help to explain it in that way. Thanks for the link, Eric. Um, but uh, as I talked about before, recognize it, know it. That's all you need to do. If you know it, then it will undermine itself for most people, right? For most people. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Yin Ling says, uh, some people describe cessation of experience in meditation as temporary Nibbana, right? What is the Bhante's opinion on it? it? Yes, that's right. So that's like a, a, a temporary experience, which is similar to Nibbana. It's obviously not the same as Nibbana, but it's like those metaphors that I was saying, like if a, if a prisoner gets released from jail, then that freedom that they experience is the same thing as the freedom of Nibbana. You can say that that's, that's, that's an experience of Nibbana because it's the experience of freedom from suffering. But of course, it's not the full experience of Nibbana because it's not a full letting go. Yeah, but I think it's really important that we that we um, that we draw that connection between those experiences that we all have and that experience of nibbana, which can often seem like a distant and unattainable goal. Uh, okay, so Akektan, uh, I, are, we, are we not supposed to cry or grieve in front of someone passing away so as not to disturb his or her mind? A chant, simple person understands Buddhism or Taoism. Okay. Um, so, yeah, uh, I think that when a person is going through the dying process and the grieving process, it, it's best to try to avoid too much uh, display of, you know, crying and grieving and emotion in front of them. Don't, don't like get obsessive about it. Like it's okay if you do cry or you are grieving in front of them, it's okay, but it's not really what they need. You know, and I remember one of my friends here in Sydney many years ago uh, was dying, and um, uh, Dr. Caro, and he, uh, you know, his family was like, family came to me and they said, look, we think he's in denial. He, he doesn't seem to want to talk about it or anything like that. And so I went to see him in the hospital. And he said, of course, I know I'm dying. He said, I'm a doctor. I know what's going on. He said, but all of these people, they're so grim all the time. I wish they'd just lighten up. And so, you know, when people are dying, they don't want you to be sad and grieving and crying. They want you to be happy. And, you know, if you can just talk about your life, talk about the things that are giving you joy and happiness in your life. And, you know, by doing that, you're reminding them that you will be okay once they're gone. So, you know, so try, try, to, try to keep a good and positive mood around people who are going through the dying process, whether before or after death, because we don't know if they're still hanging around even after they might have physically died. But um, just try to keep a good and positive mood. But if you are crying, cry, crying and grieving, it's okay. Don't, don't beat yourself up. It's all right. It's natural. Um, what to just chant, look, do some, do some, some simple chanting, some metta chanting. When I go and see people who are passing away, I usually chant the metta sutta, talk to them, just stay with them for a little bit, do a little bit of meditation. Uh, and then that's pretty good, but it just depends on, on who they are. Uh, if there's somebody who's got a spiritual practice, then try to support them to do that spiritual practice. Um, so Someone's asked me whether they die, they go to Pure Land, and then someone says, I can skip the Pure Land question. It's okay. <laughs> when they die, I can't say where, where somebody's going to go when they die, but I can say that if somebody lives a good life and fills their life with good karma and good deeds, then when they die, that none of those good deeds are going to go to waste and that they will follow according to the karma that they've made in this life. Okay. So, uh, Bobby, I believe that that's about time. Is that right? Uh, it's, it's okay up to you, Bhante. Okay, so it's, it's, it's about, according to the schedule, it's about time, and it looks like we've run out of questions. So maybe we should, um, maybe we should wrap it up then. Yeah, okay. All right. Okay, that sounds good. Do you have a, a closing that you want to do or anything like that? 
Uh, maybe Vanti can share merits. Okay, uh, so uh, very good. <clears throat> so I'll just do an informal sharing of merits for you. So I just want to everyone close your mind. Sorry, close, <laughs> so close your mind. Close your eyes. Let your mind be peaceful. And I want everyone to just recollect the time we just spent together in Dhamma and in meditation to remind yourself of the goodness that we've done through being here and sharing here together. And I want you to recollect with gratitude the uh, people from the BGF who have made this all possible. And all of those people in our lives who have supported us and who are surrounding us in this time uh, of pandemic and of difficulty. And may all of those people uh, receive the merits of our practice and whatever goodness that we've made through practicing the Dhamma, may that be for our relatives, for our friends, for all sentient beings. And may the goodness that we have made through our practice today and through our listening to Dhamma day today be for the happiness and the freedom of all sentient beings. Sadhu, sadhu.